Hey there, welcome back to Farmcraft. I'm John. This is a John Deere 1010 that we got running in the last video, believe it or not. If you haven't seen the previous videos, we've done a lot to get here and I will insert a quick breeze through update on everything we've done to this point right here. I bought this old track loader for cheap and paid just a bit over scrap price because I thought it would be fun to tinker around with. I started cleaning out the fuel filters and the fuel lines, I put in a battery, figured out the wiring, barred the engine over to make sure it wasn't locked up and cranked it over. I tried starting fluid with lousy results. I discovered that the injectors weren't getting fuel and soon realized that the injector pump wasn't working at all. So I removed it and found it was in horrible condition. With the help of area diesel service, thanks guys, I did a complete rebuild on the pump and got it pumping again, but it still wouldn't start. I then checked the compression and found that the cylinders were all well under 300 PSI, which is the minimum you would like for a diesel. At this point I was about to give up, but knowledgeable people in the audience motivated me to keep trying. Thanks for that, by the way. I pulled the injectors and gave them a good cleaning, confirmed that they were spraying fuel reasonably well, and it still wouldn't start. So I added a second battery to spin the starter with 24 volts and was able to get it to fire and run briefly on starting fluid. I decided to adjust the valves and do some leak down testing which showed that the cylinders were leaking past the rings into the crankcase. I then threw the kitchen sink at it. Heating the block with torches, heating the intake, spinning the starter with 24 volts and using starting fluid, I was able to get it to... 24 It ran! <laughs> the thing actually ran and ran? Okay. Now what I'm really curious about is after it cools off, is it going to start tomorrow or am I going to have to go through all that rigmarole again to get it going? You know what else I should do is recheck the compression. It's gotten hot, cooled off. Hmm. Maybe we're not done. Okay, it is the next day. I've had the magnetic block heater on it for a couple hours. So it's, you know, it's a little warm. It's nothing like it was yesterday. And I've got it back to 12 volts. So I'm going to see if we can start it just regular. Just needs a whiff of starting fluid, it'll probably go. Almost. off switch which is covering the intake <laughs> all right so we heat cycled her again so just there when starting it I totally forgot about the glow plugs and you know next time I do that I'll give that a try I bet you that would have done it you know this is a pre-combustion old diesel it's gonna need glow plugs to start I didn't have to do a whole lot to get it going so I'm, I'm impressed I am gonna be interested to see what the compression is after I heat cycle it a few times. So now I want to do some testing. What can the machine do? Does it move? Do the hydraulics work? Let's see what we can figure out here, but it's going to be kind of hard because I'm tethered to a garden hose since I have no cooling system. So now I need to engage the hydraulic pump by pulling up this handle. Of course, this is an old clutch and looks a little sketchy. I didn't want to put my hand right beside it in case it explodes. So what am I supposed to do? Just pull that lever up? Pump is spinning. 
lot of oil. But we got nothing. Absolutely nothing. So I tried for a while and I could only get the right side to turn at all and it was a very small amount. These steering clutches on this machine are notorious for freezing up, especially when it sat for a long time. The problem is nothing else works. The cooling system doesn't work, the hydraulics don't work, the steering clutches don't work. I think it's still a scrap machine, I hate to say it. The amount of money you would sink into this thing trying to get it functional and actually useful would be horrendous. Or would it? I couldn't leave it there. I really wonder if these steering clutches would break free. So let's see what I can do with this cooling system. I'm not going to put any significant money into this thing, but if there was a cheap or preferably free fix that I could get this thing spinning so that it would pump some water, I could put the radiator back on and I wouldn't have to be tethered to the garden hose, actually get this thing out in the field and, and drive it around and see if I can get the steering clutches to break loose. I was trying not to tear that gasket, but it tore. RTV. Well, there's your problem. Maybe I can get it freed up. It doesn't have to be perfect. I just want it to, to spin and pump a little water. sure how that's supposed to come off of there. There's no snap ring or anything. Let's say it's probably a press fit. I'm gonna break it. Good as new. <laughs> I think what was happening is there was so much rust build up on this face here that the veins of the pump were just locked against it. The bearing isn't bad. Everything you're hearing is just the impeller hitting little little bits of rust that uh, I think once we get this thing spinning and hot, a lot of that is just gonna wear off. Still spins. Okay, I'm gonna let that set up for an hour and then we will torque those down and put it back on the machine. One hour later. I went ahead and made up a little gasket for the other side here just because I didn't want to have to deal with the RTV on that little thing. Easy enough to just make one. That's a fixed water pump. I want to see what this radiator is going to do if I put water in it. I've got a plug for the bottom. Yeah, certainly uh, if it does have a leak, it's not fast enough to prevent me from filling the thing up with water and driving it around a little bit.
Here's the problem is uh, my local auto parts stores don't have a little hose like this, believe it or not. I just want to test this thing. So I think I can make this reasonably, not watertight, but slow enough in a, in a leak with Gorilla Tape that I can run this engine for a little while without it overheating. That's my goal. Yes, you are on YouTube watching a total hack at work. <laughs> not so happy with the way that's sticking or not sticking, I should say. I wish I had some waterproof tape. I wonder if electrical tape would work. See if I can just kind of back it up with some Gorilla Tape, just to give it a little more strength. I bet you that'll work for our purposes. That might be one of the nicer parts on the machine. When I first started working on this thing and found this cut belt, I thought, why cut a belt off? Now I have to get a new belt. But I can see why he cut it off, because there's no way to put the belt on there short of removing the hydraulic pump, which Maybe isn't horrible, but I'm not going to do that if I can avoid it. And uh, for an old machine that isn't working, I definitely would cut the belt. Now, this is a V-belt. I could go buy a new one, but then I have to take off the hydraulic pump. Well, I have another idea. And I don't know much about these. I actually got these for my um, woodworking tools. It's an adjustable V-belt. I think I've got these on my joiner and my old table saw. And you can see the profile there. It makes a V just like the old belt. So they are the same size as far as that's concerned. It fits well in the pulley and it's 100% it's adjustable. You just snap them together with some overlap. You know, that tooth goes through both of those and that tooth goes through there. Yep, just like that. Yeah, basically I just need to know how long. I think two of them. I think that would give me the right length. Helps if you have a pair of needle nose, which I don't have on me right now. Yeah, a little bit long. I think I need to take one more tooth out. Now I think for something that was really transmitting some power, this would not work. I don't think these, well, I don't know. My table saw is like three horsepower, three and a quarter, I think, three and three quarters. Yeah, I don't know. It runs a table saw. That's quite a bit of power. That's certainly every bit as much power as this water pump. Now, since I can break the belt and then put it back together, I can thread it over the pulley and put it on without having to remove the hydraulic pump. Install our Cadillac hose here. How long do you think that'll hold? So I'm going to start this thing again today and we're going to heat cycle it again. I want to see if this works okay. And then I'm going to have to drain it back out because it's getting late in the day already. Then tomorrow, I want to compression check it when it's cold and see if we have any difference than we had before. So this time I am going to remember to use the glow plugs, the two glow plugs I have, and see if it'll start without starting fluid. And you might be wondering why haven't I just bought a couple glow plugs? Because the cheapest I could find them, you have to buy all four and it's a hundred bucks. And it just seems like a waste of money at this point, uh, considering this is very likely to end up as a parts machine. So now I'm just going to run it until it comes out of the top of the radiator. Very slow drip on our radiator hose down there. And the level is holding at the top. So let's go ahead and give this thing a crank. 
get you where you can see the exhaust. That's where the plume of black smoke is going to come out. So first glow plugs. All right, we gave it some good glow plug. Let's crank it. You can kind of hear those two cylinders trying. I think if all four of them had glow plugs, it would start. safe to say the smokiness is not improving. <laughs> All right, now that we've been through a couple heat cycles, I really want to check the compression. I don't see how the compression is not better. This machine starts so much easier than it did before. It's got to be. It's got to be better. This cylinder was 200 the last time I checked this. Let's see. Well, that's just over 300. That looks like, yeah, that's like 305. This was my best cylinder. This one had 280. Let's see what we got here. Not much different. That's just under two, 300, so 295. Interesting. All right, this one, if I recall, was 220. That's 260. I really expected more than what I'm seeing here. I'm surprised. Well, this will be interesting. This one was 240. This is also the one that's blowing smoke like crazy. It's like 285. So they improved, they didn't improve that much. I should point out that even though the compression's better, the minimum compression ratings on this engine are 300 to 350 PSI. So it's still bad. Maybe it's so much easier to start because of the valves, because I adjusted them and they're opening when they should rather than with the delay and having the pump in time. That's probably helping too, but I mean, even on the starting fluid, it, it, it wouldn't even fire. It would barely do anything. I don't know, engines are confusing sometimes. All right, I'm gonna put the glow plugs back in. You don't need to see that. It has been a few days, holidays are over. Let's get back to work. I want to see what functions on this machine work. Obviously it moved back and forth a little bit, but I think those steering clutches will probably break free if I take this thing out and drive it around. I've got the cooling system sorted. Before I do anything else, I wanna check all the fluids. There is a reservoir for the reverser, the shuttle shift, this thing the forward in reverse. And then there's also a reservoir for the transmission. So I'm pretty sure this is the dipstick for the, the reverser, but it won't budge. So we're gonna have to use a tool or something on that. Another thing I was a little curious about, I think I know the answer, is where's all that smoke coming from? I don't think it's unburnt fuel. Unburnt fuel, it's kind of a characteristic look and smell. And I don't get that with this. And if you recall, our oil was very overfilled when we started. Well, it's not as full as it was. You can see I'm about an inch lower than, than the oil has been. And I haven't done anything to lower the oil. So this thing's burning it. Pretty sure it's burning it when, when I try to turn the engine off and it won't turn off. It just keeps running. But also it's burning it while the engine's running. Mostly out of cylinder four, I think. Because its oil ring is gone. It may very well be gone. It might be broken sitting in the bottom of the oil pan. Let's get some channel locks on this and see if this will move. Yeah. Okay. Got nothing in there. 
That's no good. Got a wire here. Just going to pass it all the way to the bottom. Which is a long way. I bent the rod where the oil starts. It's got that much oil in the bottom there. Yeah. And looking at the dipstick, that bend is just below. Can you see that? Just below the dipstick. So, yeah. That, that oil will be fine for what we're doing. It actually looks pretty clean, too. All right, here's the transmission oil. Right at the full mark. It's not the best looking oil in the world, but I don't think driving it around a little bit just to see what works is gonna matter at this point. Another thing I discovered, which may be good news for this machine, or at least some of the parts on it, is the hydraulic oil, which I thought was right at the bottom of the stick, I don't think has any oil in it. Let's take a wire down here. Yeah, that's all the way at the bottom. Yeah, right there. So I've got like an inch of oil in the bottom of that tank. Well, that tells me that there's probably a pretty significant leak somewhere. And of course this thing takes, I think it's almost five gallons of oil. It's um, not gonna be cheap to fill it up. But just to kind of see what works and see where any leaks are, I'm thinking I may put the hydraulic oil that was in my boom lift. Uh, I have a bucket of it that I saved for bar and chain oil. I can put that in here and just kind of see what it would take to make the hydraulics function. So I'm gonna start this thing, we're gonna warm it up, and then I'm gonna try to drive it around and see if I can get the steering clutches to break free. So I took it out in the field and gave it a test. The shuttle shift works great and all the gears in the transmission work uh, and the tracks work fine. You know, they don't, they don't make a lot of noise, they don't have excessive play or anything like that. After a little while I was able to get the right steering clutch to sort of start functioning. I had to use the, the clutch lever in combination with the right foot brake to get it to turn. So I think I just need to adjust that clutch and it would work properly. I could not get the left side to do anything.
Let's put some hydraulic oil in this thing. And as I'm doing this, I'm gonna stop and look and see if there's leaks before I do not see any. So I'm gonna fill this thing up, I'll bring you back. I've got an oil pan ready if I spring a leak. It's not leaking yet. But let's try it again without starting fluid. So where do we stand at this point? We have a pretty solid undercarriage on this machine. You know, I'm not gonna say those sprockets are without wear, but they're not sharp, and they definitely have some life left in them. The, uh, the track chains also have a good bit of life, and the grouser depth is good. So the undercarriage on this machine is worth salvaging for somebody. The hydraulics actually work if you put fluid to it. All it needs is a single hydraulic line, and the bucket loader function would work fine. Those cylinders aren't even leaking in spite of the state of the rods. Uh, the rods on these main lift cylinders actually didn't look bad. Uh, these had pitting on the, the far end of it. The cooling system actually holds water. Obviously you would need a new hose there. The water pump is working fine. None of this leaks. Uh, and this doesn't leak anymore. So, you know, that all is good. The charging system I have not addressed. I don't know the state of the transmission, but everything worked there as well as the uh, the forward and reverse. And I did not check the final drives, but obviously they worked too. Anyway, what I'm getting at is the engine is the primary issue with this machine. Even for a country boy farmer, this thing smokes too much. And uh, I'm really curious because most of it's coming out of that fourth cylinder there. Now I've been looking at parts to get new sleeves for this machine is like $1,600 just for the sleeves. And the rings are like $200 for a set of four. Uh, a new head gasket is $200. I mean, the parts are rather expensive. So I'm not promising anything at this point, but I wanna open it up, kind of see what's there. Maybe I could just hone the cylinders and I guess put some new rings in it. I don't really wanna drop 200 bucks on this thing. But regardless, what we're definitely gonna do right now is we're gonna pull this back in and we're gonna drop the oil pan, we're gonna rip this thing apart, pull the head, look at the pistons, look at the rings, and let's see what's going on with this thing.
All right, it took a little while. I've got it chained up. I've also got it propped up on the hydraulic cylinders. So there's actually three things holding it because the cylinders themselves would actually hold it. These are holding it and then the chains are holding it. So I feel pretty comfortable working underneath that. So we get to start disassembling again. That's a quality hose right there. These you want to keep in their respective positions. So that's cylinder one. This is the front of the engine and I've just got the, the rods lined up just like they were. Probably a leakage between those two cylinders. See, that looks okay. Yeah, you can see like sort of clean gasket material like this right in between them, but this looks burned in between them. Yeah, that was definitely leaking. But just between the cylinders, I don't see any leaks to external and I don't see anything to the coolant passages. Cylinder two and three, you know, they really don't look that bad. The walls are smooth. I don't feel any scratches. Let's give her a spin. Ooh. Now that one, that one's got some scratches. Cylinder one, those are uh, pretty deep. It even catches a screwdriver there. And about four. So, one has the worst scratches in the bore, and I must say it's not it's not horrible. All of them are glazed. That basically just means that the cross hatch that was originally on them is just totally gone. The walls are polished smooth, and there's been blow by, so there's been combusting gases that uh, go all up and down the cylinder and and basically just produce like a glaze on it. So that would need to be honed. I don't see that as a problem so much as those scratches. I don't know how much metal we would have to remove to get that back to reasonable. All right, so the next thing to do, we need to get to the bottom of this. So I need to get underneath, drain the oil, pull the oil pan, and then we will see the crankshaft and the underside of the pistons where they attach to the crankshaft. I'm 
I need to get that out of the way. That, of course, is the oil pickup screen. Oh. That was heavier than I expected. Yeah, so it turns out that wasn't just like the pickup tube. Uh, this is actually the oil pump. And this is the shaft that uh, the, the fuel injection pump mates with. That's the 180 degree that I was lining the shaft of the fuel injection pump with. See, that shaft now is going down into the block and <clears throat> that's what it was meeting up with. So here's the oil pan and there are some chunks. Uh, if that was metal, it was totally rusted. I don't think it is. Just, it's magnetic, though. Yeah, it must be. I'm not seeing anything that I can definitively say is a piece of rings. Still suspicious that I'm going to find some broken rings in uh, cylinder four. This is pretty cool. We're in the front of the engine. This is the hydraulic pump here. So right there is the, the crankshaft, and this gear is driving that gear over to the right there. Well, that is the camshaft. You can see it up there. Let's see. There you can see one of the lobes right there. These are the crankshaft bearings, and these are the caps that are holding the connecting rod to the pistons. So if I take those off, this will come off, and then the piston will be free and can be pushed out the top. So that's another one, and that's piston. That's actually piston two, and this is piston one. So one, two, three, and four. Now I'm hoping this will show up on camera, but right there coming off of that camshaft is the gear that uh, drives the oil pump. And that that you're seeing right in that hole, that is the bottom of the fuel injection pump. So we saw that from the other side when we were rebuilding that. Well, now we're at the bottom. That's where the oil pump went up and uh, that's what was driving that. So overall, the inside of the crankcase here looks better than I expected. These uh, counterbalance weights have a fair amount of rust on them, but you know, most of it looks okay. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that uh, some of this was up out of the oil for a long time when uh, it was sitting and had a lot of condensation and a lot of time to rust. That's the dipstick right there. All right, got a good look under here. Uh, let's start taking some caps off. okay just from appearance so I just took a minute to make sure they all have uh, a little pip on them that faces the right side of the machine and that's as you're in the driver's seat and that little pip is not on the other side see there's nothing there and it also matches the connecting rod up above so this is future me uh, these are it's a lot easier to show you once I have these out but that right there and that right there are the pips that I'm talking about, that little bump. They are only on one side. When I flip this over, there are no pips on this side. And I even discovered there's a little two. This is cylinder two. So that's really nice. Ensures that I'm gonna have them organized correctly. So I'm gonna keep these oriented correctly and also numbered. So this is cylinder one. And then I'll take off two, three, and four and keep these all in order. That ain't good. Rotate. So that's going to push those cylinders up. They won't come back down because there's no cap to pull them back down. So now we can get those two. I mean, so far they all look pretty reasonable. It'll be interesting when we measure them. Let's rotate again. It 
doesn't want to keep rotating with uh, those loose up there. Yeah, I got to get those pistons out. So let me go get a block of wood or something that I can tap them out of there with. I want to come out of there. So there's just a little bit of carbon build up here and that's per the rings when they hit that are sticking and preventing me from pushing them up and out. So I'm going to take a minute and clean all that up. Just using a little scotch Bright and some WD-40. Piston one, a little bit of wear on that skirt. That's your oil scraping ring, and then it's got three compression rings, none of which are stuck. All of which I bet are pretty worn down. The wrist pin has basically no play in it. The back and forth is, I think, that's to be expected. Yeah, no play there. Feels tight. Okay, cylinder two. A little bit of wear on the skirt. Not bad though. Rings are all free. And the oil ring looks fine. Three. A little more wear on that skirt, I think. I think those rings are just totally worn out because even if you compress them all the way they don't even get close to uh, to touching Ooh, look at that four broken ring That's rather gratifying to see an obvious cause of the poor performance of that one. Now the other rings are not stuck and um, don't look horrible, but uh, having that one ring missing I guess is enough. There's a reason they put three. So in spite of the broken ring, it feels nice and smooth. Uh, the cylinder bore is actually just like the other, like, like two and three. So one is the worst. Well, I can tell you the uh, crankshaft has like no play in it that I can feel. And it turns really well. I think, uh, well, hopefully this is going to come out okay. But for right now, I want to measure it and see how big these journals are, see if they're round or not. It's hard to imagine more boring content than watching someone measure something with a micrometer. So we're gonna go through this fast. So I'm gonna go around uh, all four of them, measure them up, and then we'll go back and look at the specs. All right, and I also need to uh, measure the bores. I wanna make sure they're round. I'm gonna measure in multiple places and kind of see where we are. I 
So if I was to re-sleeve this engine, it is possible, but they're not individual sleeves on this. This is kind of a goofy design. This entire area right here is a sleeve deck. So that and all four sleeves are one piece. And that part, I initially thought it cost 1600 bucks. It looks like it cost more like 2000 So to do a full rebuild, that's what you would do. Uh, I'm not going to do that. This engine is just not worth that much money. All right, so here's the deal. Um, I am actually quite amazed with what I'm finding. The connecting rod journals uh, on the crankshaft, 2.3085 to 2.3095. Mine were all 85 to 9, so they're all within spec. I'm amazed by that. They were round, and there was no. Uh, they all look great. Uh, the cylinders themselves are supposed to be 3.625 to 3.626, with a wear limit of 10 thousandths. So, in other words, it can go 3.625 to 3.635, actually 3.6 as the maximum. So, uh, mine measured, the worst one, interestingly, was cylinder 4, which doesn't have any scratches on the wall, but it did have the broken ring, which apparently did some wear to the wall, uh, because it got up to 3.631 at the worst. Now, I measured at multiple depths in the cylinder. They were all round to within two thousandths, a little bit less. This is still five thousandths under the maximum allowable limit. Um, the one that was scratched, which is cylinder one, the maximum I got was 3.629. So that is seven thousandths under the allowable limit, which means I'm going to be able to hone those scratches almost all the way out, I think. And the others were, were fine, 3.628 to 3.629. So the cylinders are good. I measured the pistons, which they want you to measure at the bottom of the skirt. And they are all fine. They all are within spec. This is cylind uh, piston one. And um, what I'm doing is measuring the uh, dimension here. Just using the same thing, using a bore gauge and a micrometer. And what I'm getting is 2.313, actually between 2.312 and 2.313, depending on where I measure it. Well, here's the deal. And on cylinder one, it was 2.3085, so 2.308. And I'm getting 2.313, that's five thousandths difference. The five makes it four and a half. Well, my bearing insert oil clearance is basically four and a half thousandths. So I am just at or above the upper limit of spec on this. So that's not ideal. Now there's another way to check this using plastic gauge. You put a, a strip of it in there and you put this back over the crankshaft journal and you torque it down. This is torqued down to the proper spec. And plastic gauge is normally how, how I would think to do this, but it really is a hassle to have to put this all the way back in. The service manual actually said to do it this way, so I'm kind of happy that I can do it this way. It's a lot easier. Anyway, I did get 2.312 in a couple spots, so between three and a half and four and a half on this one. Uh, so that's not ideal. I think it would work, but if I can get some new inserts, uh, I think that would be nice. These look, they look a little worn. Now I'm measuring it without the bearing in place to make sure that the actual bore for the bearings is in spec. Click. Oh yeah, I don't have to fake this. I still see the cross hatch, so I suspect this is going to be fine. Hope I'm right. So let's see what we get. I don't know what that dimension is right now as I measure. I kind of like to do that so that I don't like bias myself towards the right number. So that is two point four three six. Let's see what we get. Bearing bore 2.4365 to 2.4375. So yeah, doesn't surprise me. Still see the cross hatch. I would not expect any wear in that. There you can see, definitely have some wear in those bearings. Now if I was doing a full engine rebuild on this, I would do all of the bearings, uh, including on the crankshaft but I don't feel any play whatsoever on the crankshaft and I just don't want to open up that can of worms. So I need some new bearings if I can get them. 
If not, I mean, these are at the upper limit of spec, so I could put these back in, but these should be cheap. Ugh, shouldn't have said that. The head really looks pretty good. I have some cleaning up to do on some of these water passages, but uh, the valves don't look bad, and I think what I'm going to do is lap the valves since I'm here. Mine as well. This is piston one. One thing I noticed is the oil ring is broken and uh, that's the exact width that the scratches were. So right there, that's what caused the scratches in that cylinder bore. Yeah, see how wide those end gaps are? When I fully compress this thing, there's still, that, that's supposed to be on the order of thousands, not not that big. So I really think these rings are just really worn. The easiest way to get them off is just gonna be to use my fingers. Just kind of work them up off of there. And break it. I got the second one off without breaking it. that one's gonna break it's already broken Houston we have a problem this is piston 4 that's not a ring, that's the piston. That sucks. Didn't want to see that. So this is unfortunate. On further inspection, I have two cracked pistons. See that right there? So that thing is cracked. I mean, I can see it moving all the way over here. So it's not even attached from like here to there. So that's on that one. That's number three. And then here's number four. Yeah, it's a little worse. I can see it moving all the way over here, so. Well, Mr. Deer, I've got some bad news. There's just no easy way to say this. But uh, I can't even find the two pistons. Uh, they don't even sell them anymore. And the ones that I can find that might work, I'm not even sure they will, are $650 a piece. That's $1,300 plus tax and everything. It's going to be $1,400 just for the pistons. You add in the rings, the gaskets, and the other things that I'm going to need, the glow plugs, the air filter, we're at $2,000. And, um, and I'm sorry, I just, I think it's the end of the road. I know, buddy. But everything has to end. Everyone has their time. And I think this is yours. Quit looking at me like that. Yeah, I know, I could put the, the 2000 into you, but I'm never gonna get it back. I mean, not the puppy dog eyes. What, you too? Man, everyone's looking at me like this. The pressure. In actuality, I know how you're looking at me, and uh, this doesn't make any sense at all, but I'm gonna figure out how to make this darn thing run. Uh, this is where maybe being stubborn is a good or bad thing, but uh, I just wanna, I just wanna do it. <laughs> Let's see what we can figure out. So what are my options here? Well, the way I see it, I basically got three options. I can either fix these, I can make new ones, or I can find some used ones. I think the best answer is to fix these. This area between the grooves is called the land, and that is loose all the way to here. Well, that can obviously be removed. There's plenty of thickness behind it. Basically, if I can remove this and then TIG weld it and put the metal back 
and build it back up, I can then machine the grooves back into it and I'm back to square one. And I think that's a reasonable uh, solution at this point. Now here's the deal. I don't have an AC TIG welder. This is not a good choice for me to do my first aluminum welding job on. Uh, I have a really good friend who is a professional welder and he told me that he can weld this back up for me. And uh, I think I'm gonna have him do that. Now this is something that he's gonna do at his job, which is a couple hours from here, and it's not something that I can go there and film. Uh, I'll see if he can get some footage of it, but very likely these are just gonna come back to me with that all filled in. And then we'll throw them on the lathe, we'll remachine the grooves, get it round again, and I think that'll be a reasonable repair. While I do think that I could make some new ones, uh, it would be a tremendous amount of work. These are cast and have a kind of a funky profile. I would have to do a significant amount of work just making a mold and then machining every surface of it, getting the skirt right, getting all this right, um, and ending up with a no casting defect, good quality final part. Uh, that, would be, <laughs> that would be several videos in itself, I think. And then obviously the other option of just getting used ones, which, you know, I suspect when I put this video out, uh, I will have some people approach me and uh, please do because we're going to try to weld this and I'm going to try to machine it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but if that doesn't work, then I think getting used ones would be my next fallback. If this was a better, more valuable machine, I would be more willing to put in the time to make my own new pistons. Um, something that I would actually have fun doing, but it just kind of feels silly at this point. This machine is just not worth anywhere near what I'm putting into it, let alone that. So that's where we stand at this point. My shop is a wreck, the machine is in pieces, and I'm gonna order some parts and see if we can't get these pistons fixed up. I think it'd be really cool to get this old girl running again, and I wanna see if I can get her running well without smoke. I'm gonna be working on that. Now this is probably gonna take several weeks, getting these fixed, getting the new parts, waiting on things to arrive in the mail. Uh, this is gonna take some time. So be patient, but I will definitely be posting on this in the future. If you like the video, don't forget to hit the like button. That really helps the channel out. And also uh, subscribe. You know, subscribing is free and that helps the channel out as well. All you're doing is telling YouTube this is the kind of content you want to see in the future. If you want to help out the channel more directly, come check me out on Patreon. Got a real good group of folks over there and I really appreciate the support everyone is sending my way. I'll keep working really hard to make good content for you guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.